Hi folks, Dr. B. So continuing from where we left off, what I'd like to talk about now are some more muscles of the arm. And specifically, we're gonna talk about the rotator cuff muscles, the muscles that move the forearm and the muscles that move the hand and wrist. So let's start with the rotator cuff muscles. This is a set of muscles whose tendons form a ring around the top of the humerus and help to stabilize and rotate it. And so because of this, these are one of the common muscles that's injured, for example, classically in baseball pitchers because they're so frequently raising and rotating their arms that they can apply a lot of wear and tear to these rotator cuff muscles. Um, and again, they are called a rotator cuff muscle because they're involved in rotating it and they form a cuff or ring around the top of the humerus. So let's look at these muscles and this is a set of four muscles. And so if we look here at these figures from OpenStax, let me make them a little bigger. So the four muscles we are going to be looking at are the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and then in the front of the arm, we have the subscapularis tucked around here. And you'll notice that these names are actually very similar to some of the fossa that we talked about when we were looking at the scapula. So if we look at our scapula, here's our scapula. Remember, we have the subscapular fossa where it sits flat against the back and the muscle that's part of the rotator cuff is the subscapularis. In the front, we have the supraspinatus uh, fossa that's up above the spine, supra meaning above the spine, and we have a supraspinatus muscle as part of the rotator cuffs. And then under the spine, we have the infraspinous fossa below the spine, and we have the infraspinatus muscle. And then at the very, towards the very bottom, we have the teres minor, which if you remember, teres means rope, and this is going to run parallel to the teres major, but it'll be a little smaller. So those four muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and teres minor form the rotator cuff. And a mnemonic to remember that is SITS, S-I-T-S, -S, that the rotator cuff sits on the shoulder. And S for supraspinatus, I for infraspinatus, T for teres major, and then flipping around to the anterior side of the scapula, we have the S for the subscapularis. So we literally have S, I, T, and we'll get all four rotator cuff muscles in that way. All right, so let's start with the supraspinatus. And all of these muscles, as we said, are gonna be involved in rotating or abducting the humerus and stabilizing the shoulder. So let me share my screen again. And so here, again, we're gonna start with the supraspinatus up at the top of the scapula connecting into the head of the humerus. And here is a view of that. Well, it's not a view of that. Oh, it's going to be here, okay. So pulling away these muscles of the back and lifting off the trapezius, the deltoid, that big flat latissimus dorsi. We've got the teres major here. So we're gonna lift all of those away. And here you can see we have the supraspinatus the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the teres major, which is not part of that rotator cuff. So let's start by looking just at that supraspinatus. And right off the bat, you can see it's in that supraspinous fossa, and it's connecting along that medial border of the uh, scapula, running along that fossa, tucking under that acromion process, and coming around the humerus to connect in to the uh, lateral side of that humerus to some extent. So specifically, the origin is what we would call the supraspinous fossa, particularly that back medial edge of the supraspinous fossa. And the insertion 
is that outer greater tubercle of the humerus. It's not tucking under or wrapping as far around as those ones that were going into that sulcus we talked about last time. So this is coming past the head to that large greater tubercle. So looking at our bone here, So looking at our bone here, we have the head, we have the greater and lesser tubercle, and so we're going to come past the head to this greater tubercle, so somewhat lateral part of the humerus. Getting my little man. I'm going to be putting the clay from this back edge of the supraspinous fossa tucking it under that acromion process out around this humerus to that greater tubercle. All right, I will be right back. All right, so here you can see we've connected that supraspinatus up along that fossa, tucked under that acromion process, and come around to the side of that humerus into that greater tubercle. So, what this muscle does is it's going to be able to pull, it's almost going along the top, you can see, of this humerus. So it's not wrapped enough around the back to do any rotation here. It will help stabilize the shoulder, which is true of most of these rotator cuff muscles. But what it's actually going to do when it contracts, you'll see it comes up along the top and pulls. And if we pull this way, as that shortens, that's going to abduct the humerus and actually lift that arm. And if you remember, that rotator cuff muscle that gets damaged in baseball players is because they are lifting the arm and then later rotating it. And here, this muscle is taking wear and tear when that arm is lifted. So the supraspinatus up on top is lifting this um, humerus. So it's involved in lifting the brachium or elevating, I should say elevation, of the arm. All right, back to this overview of the back. And the next muscle we're going to look at is under the supraspinatus, under the spine of the scapula, we get to the infraspinatus in that infraspinous fossa. So again, if we lift away this trapezius and this deltoid, and to some extent this latissimus dorsi, you can actually see part of the infraspinatus, unlike the supraspinatus, lift those away. So under that supraspinatus, under the spine of that scapula is the infraspinatus. And it's still sitting up sort of superficial to this teres minor and superior to the teres major. So let's look at this infraspinatus in more detail. This is a muscle that, as you can see, runs along this infraspinous fossa. So its origin is this back medial edge of the infraspinous fossa of the scapula. And it runs kind of under that spine and then wraps around the humerus to once again connect into the greater tubercle. So supraspinous went kind of up over the top of the humerus to grab it, and that's why it could pull it outwards and abduct, this one's going to wrap around from the side and twist it backwards to create a type of rotation. So as I get out my uh, skeleton and start putting on the clay, one thing to think about is what type of rotation will that be? Medial or lateral? So picture this muscle, look at it, think about how it would contract. Will that arm rotate out to the side and backwards? or into the front and inwards. Out to the side and backwards is lateral rotation. In towards the body frontwards is medial rotation. So think about what type of rotation it's going to do. All right, so here you can see I took my skeleton. We still have the supraspinatus muscle coming up and along to the top to pull or abduct that arm upwards. And here we have the infraspinatus muscle wrapping around, and it's going to pull it back and around, and that's going to create a lateral rotation, back and around. 
So that's a lateral rotation of this humerus or arm or brachium. So let's get the next muscle on. We're going to go one step lower and a little bit deeper and hit that T of the SITS. So that's going to be the teres minor. So again, here we are at the back of the body. Let's lift off that trapezius, deltoid, latissimus dorsi. And now we see the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and you can see the teres major down here at the bottom of that scapula. Let's lift those away. And you can see right here underneath them and under, lower than the infraspinatus, above the teres major is that smaller teres minor. Remember that teres means rope-like or cord-like, rounded. And we do have this rounded rope-like muscle. And this one is basically the little rope instead of the big rope. It connects from, rather than this back medial border, it connects from this lateral border of the scapula, um, specifically the dorsal or back edge of the scapula rather than the anterior side of the scapula. It connects from that lateral border around, again, to the greater tubercle of the humerus. So all three of these, SIT, connect to that greater tubercle. So you can probably guess it connects very similarly to that infraspinatus. So you can probably guess that it's going to do the same type of movement. It's going to stabilize that shoulder and it's going to rotate laterally. So let's go ahead and get our skeleton out. Let me stop share. And I'm going to take this muscle off and we're going to come from this lateral edge instead of the back edge around to the side. So if we had the scapula, this is actually scapula here. We're going to come from this lateral edge around the side of the arm. So I'll get that set up. All right, this should probably be down here a little farther, but you got the general idea. It's pulling the shoulder uh, scapula down and around. So it's stabilizing the scapula, but at the same time, if it contracts, it's going to rotate that humerus along its axis, rotate it, back towards the scapula that is lateral rotation. So the final of the, ooh, there it goes, <laughs> the final of the SITS, the rotator cuff, we have another S. It's going to be visible from the front, but it's going to be tucked under the scapula. This is going to be the subscapularis because sub is under, like a submarine under the scapula and it's going to be in that subscapular fossa again coming around to the humerus. So let's take a look at that muscle. So here we have the front of the body rather than the back, the anterior side. You can see that pectoralis major, the deltoid of the shoulder. We can see part of that serrata anterior. We're going to lift some of these away. So lift a little bit away, and then let's lift even more away. Oops, that's too far. Don't lift quite that much away. All right, here we go. Let's lift some of that away. And a little more. Here we go. Now that we have that out of the way, you can see that under, behind the scapula, subscapular, deeper, to the body than the scapula, we have that subscapularis. So it's between, it's superficial to the back of the ribs, but deep to the scapula. It's sitting in that subscapular fossa where the scapula glides along the back of the body. So this is the subscapularis. Again, its origin is in that subscapular fossa, particularly that medial back edge and it runs from that medial edge of the subscapular fossa around the front rather than the back like the other ones or the top. It runs around the front of that humerus and rather than reach all the way around to the greater tubercle over here, which is where most of them had been reaching to, 
or as we've talked about a few things into this sulcus in between the two tubercles, we're going to stop at this lesser tubercle. So here we come around the front to that lesser tubercle. You can probably already guess by the way it pulls that this is going to be able to cause a rotation of the arm. And again, because of the side that it's pulling from, think about whether that's going to be medial twisting towards the front or lateral twisting out away from the body towards the back. So think about which type of rotation that's going to be. And I'm going to build that onto my little skeleton. So here we have it. It's tucked, I couldn't get it all the way under, but it's tucked under that scapula and around the front of the humerus to that lesser tubercle. And when it pulls, it's going to twist the arm in towards the body, which is a medial rotation of the arm or a medial rotation of that humerus. Excuse me, drinking too much soda today. So those are SITS, our four muscles of the scapula. Give me one second. There we go. And by the way, that's four muscles of the rotator cuff, not the scapula. I'm getting a little turned around here. So here is the open stacks diagrams, and here's the back view of that arm. Here's the front view. And you can see we have sit supraspinatus here, infraspinatus here, teres minor, which you'll notice one big distinction between teres minor and teres major is how they teres major reaches around the front rather than behind the back. So SIT, and then in the very front, tucked under everything, here is the subscapularis, tucked under all these other muscles and behind the rib cage. So with the rotator cuff done, we are going to move on to the muscles that move the forearm. And in order to move the forearm, we're going to want muscles that cross this joint. Before we were moving the arm, so we were crossing somewhere from the main body, the scapula, the pectoral girdle, the clavicle, somewhere in the main body, crossing onto the humerus. Now, or occasionally just to the scapula, it's for an indirect control. Now we're gonna wanna cross probably from this humerus somewhere onto the forearm, the radius or ulna. And by crossing across this elbow joint, we can move this forearm. So let's take a peek at those muscles. So as we talk about muscles that move this forearm, this antebrachium, you want to think about what are the key movements of this forearm. So this arm at this shoulder joint could abduct and adduct. It could flex and extend, and it could rotate medially or laterally. And we didn't talk about it, but if you start combining those, you get things like that cone-like movement of circumduction that's things like throwing a baseball where you're combining a bunch of different movements all at once. That's because this is a ball and socket joint that has a lot of flexibility in how it moves. Now, when we get to your elbow, you'll notice this is a lot more simple in the movements. Between this humerus and these two bones, we have a hinge joint. The elbow is a hinge joint, and that means it can only bend along one axis. It can flex and extend. Flex, extend, flex, extend. And in order to rotate, rather than a true rotation where one of these long bones would rotate along its axis, we are actually going to cross these bones over like that. Then we are going to pronate when we cross the bones and supinate when we straighten the bones. And we talked last time when we looked at the bones about how that's using the two joints that are between the ulna and the radius. Join up here, the uh, proximal radial ulnar joint and joint down here, the distal radial ulnar joint. So when these two bones rotate together, we get the pronation and supination. So we have basically a few key movements. We have, we can, if we pull across the front of this joint, 
we will be able to flex the forearm. If we pull across the back of the elbow joint, this way, we will be able to extend the forearm, straighten it. And then if we twist, pulling from here to this side or from here to this side, that will help us to pronate or supinate the forearm. So we're going to talk about three muscles that are primarily involved in flexing the arm because that's one of the most powerful movements you want to be able to make. We're going to talk about one muscle on the back of the arm that's involved in extending that joint. And then we're going to talk about one muscle that's very important in pronating the forearm and one muscle that's very important in supinating the forearm. There are, of course, more muscles in the arm than this, but we're going to simplify it. Um, particularly more muscles in the forearm once we get there. So let's look at the first, let's look at three muscles that run across the front of this joint and are primarily involved in creating that strong flexion or bending of the elbow joint. All right, so the first three muscles we're gonna talk about, as I said, are primarily involved in flexing the forearm and they're gonna run across the front of that elbow joint. And that's gonna be this here, this biceps brachii. This one that's a little farther down and behind, the brachialis. And then one that starts on low on this humor and runs mostly along the forearm. So we're gonna come down here, starting low on the humerus, running mostly along the forearm is this brachioradialis. So two that run mostly along the upper arm, one that runs mostly along the forearm, but both of them cross or all three of them cross the elbow joint. So they're gonna be important in flexing this arm. Uh, sorry, flexing the forearm, the antibrachium. So let's start with the biceps brachii. So here we have a view of the front of the body. As always, we have that deltoid coming over the shoulder, the pectoralis forming the chest, and running very anterior, often the one you really think of, of like show off your biceps when you're showing off your guns. I don't really have any because I have no muscle strength. Um, that's your biceps brachii right here, forming that big strong bulge in your arm. So if I lift the muscles away, you can see the biceps brachii. Why is it called the biceps brachii? Well, biceps by means two it means two headed and if you look here where it originates it has two heads it actually divides into two or origin points so it is a biceps because it has two heads brachii remember the brachium is the arm so brachii refers to the arm and i want to point this out because later on when we get to the legs we're going to talk about the biceps femoris which is a very similar muscle with two heads. It basically makes up the biceps of your leg. But in this case, rather than the brachii or the arm, it's femoris or the femur. And the femur is basically your leg's version of the humerus. So we'll have a very similar muscle that we'll talk about later. And it is also called the biceps, but it has a different name. This is the biceps of the brachii or the arm. Later, we'll do the biceps of the leg, the femoris. So here's our biceps brachii. And this one originates at the coracoid process of the scapula, which if you remember is not that upper acromion point, the high point of the shoulder. It's this lower, almost uh, below the clavicle point that comes forward. So the coracoid process of the scapula, that's one head. The other head is on the tubercle above the glenoid cavity of the scapula. So you notice it's kind of wrapping around this humerus to help anchor everything. Um, so one up here on the scapula, one up here on the top of the humerus. So we're anchored to both the scapula and the humerus. And by pulling hard on these and then crossing this elbow joint, we're going to have a strong lever to pull and flex that forearm. 
So this head down here, sorry, not head, but this insertion point down here is on the radial tuberosity of the, of course, radius. So if we get out our radius, nope, that's my ulna. If we get out our radius, you might remember that to recognize the radius, you want to look for this kind of flat, rounded head of the radius. And this bump here is the radial tuberosity. Remember that bump means something's pulling on it really hard. And sure enough, it's being pulled on really hard by that biceps. It's doing a lot of the pulling motion of lifting this arm. So this provides a lot of the strength involved in flexing the arm. Now this one, unlike the other two, can also help to supinate the arm. And so when we put this guy onto our skeleton, and look at how it attaches, you want to think about how it can be involved in potentially supinating that arm. So let me get it all attached. Remember, we're going to come from this sort of inner top of the humerus. This, yeah, I was checking if that was the clavicle or not. This inner point of the uh, coracoid process of the scapula. So we're going to pull here. We're going to come down along the arm to this radial bump of the radius. All right, be right back. All right, so here's my very messily applied wrapping unnecessarily around the back, biceps brachii coming again from the under here. Whoops, there it goes, and it's gone. It did not want to stay on but it is coming from this coracoid process right here, from up around the top kind of inner edge of this humerus, all the way along the humerus down to this radial tuberosity. And it's pretty easy to see how pulling on this radial tuberosity will flex the arm. It may be a little more confusing how it supinates the arm, especially because it almost looks like maybe it should be pulling it uh, inwards to pronate it. And so I'm going to show you another image, but it does have the strongest supination effect when the arm is already flexed. So it helps to let your palm turn outwards while your arm is flexed. So it's helpful for those curls. When you're doing this, that's why you have your palm turned outwards, supinated. That requires your biceps. And lifting that arm requires your biceps. So this motion is working your biceps. That's why that's the classic, check out my guns. All right, so let me put up a picture that I think will help. Share screen, screen two, and uh, this one we already saw. And so this image I found just online <laughs> somewhere. And so this is the flexed biceps brachii, and you can kind of see here how that pulling that radius helps to keep the radius from turning inwards. It pulls it up a little bit and helps to supinate the forearm and keep that radius turned outwards away from the body rather than inwards. So that is the supination action. The main action is going to be flexion and we will have a muscle that's more involved in supination later. So next, let's move on from the biceps brachii to the brachialis. And this one's going to be uh, a little lower down the arm and tucked a little more uh, laterally. So again, here's the biceps brachii, very anterior and tucked a little, starting a little lower, a little deeper, and maybe a little more lateral. Behind it, let's lift that away, is the brachialis. Biceps brachii, brachialis. What does brachialis mean? Well, it literally means on the arm, on the upper arm. And you'll notice that unlike the biceps brachii, which is um, running all the way along this and also attached to the scapula, this one is only running from the humerus, especially that lower half of the humerus, down rather than onto the radius, it goes onto the ulna. So this is the brachialis. And the brachialis, as we said, literally means arm. This is the arm muscle. It's going to be involved in flexing the forearm, the antebrachium. 
and its origin is the front side of the distal or lower humerus, which you can kind of see a little bit more distal on the humerus, more on the interior side. And then it comes down there, and rather than come to the radial tuberosity, like the biceps brachii, it's going to come to a process called the coronoid process on the ulna, which you'll notice is kind of another bump that's kind of similar. This bump is a little less pronounced. Let me find my ulna. Here we go. So here's my ulna. Remember, it looks like a socket wrench. And here, you'll see a less pronounced bump along the front, but still pretty sturdy for pulling on with that brachialis. So we're going to get our skeleton man. Skeleton man, skeleton man. Have you guys heard that song? My favorite. And we're going to come from the front, lower end of this humerus down to right about here, this coronoid process of the ulna. And this is going to not allow any supination or pronation. It's just going to allow some flexing of this arm. So let me get that built on there. And then here we go. Oh, it looks like it's actually on the radius here. Here we go. Brachialis coming along the front of that humerus from the lower and lower front side of it to that coronoid process on the ulna. So the next and last of the flexing muscles that we're going to talk about is the one that starts very, very low on the humerus and runs mostly along the radius of the arm. This is the brachioradialis because it's mostly on this radius. So let me get a picture of that up for you. So you'll probably notice right away that they've moved the image to focus more on that forearm, the antibrachium, because that's where most of this muscle is and that there are a bunch of muscles in the forearm. And we are really going to collapse a lot of these muscles when we get down here and not try to learn each, uh, each and every one. One of the reasons there's so many muscles in your forearm is look at all these fingers you gotta move. You gotta have lots of special muscles for each of them. Um, so let's see, up here you can see the biceps brachii and a little bit behind it and under it, the brachialis. And then coming around, from that humerus in green is the brachioradialis. So let's pull away some of these muscles. You can see it a little better here. And here's the brachioradialis. And so its name literally means it's on the arm, brachio, and then it follows the radius, radialis. Pretty straightforward. So this muscle starts on the lateral, that is the side edge of the supracondylar ridge. So remember these bumps on each side of the humerus are the epicondyles. So the ridges that run along the lateral side are going to be and above the top of the condyle will be the supracondylar ridge. There's going to be a ridge right along here. And let's get a humerus out and take a peek at that in just a minute. But it's going to run from that lateral edge of the humerus down around the front of the radius and follow that radius and it's going to connect into the base of the styloid process of the radius. And if you remember the styloid process is you have a lateral styloid process on your radius and a medial styloid process on your ulna and those are the points at the edges of your wrist that you can feel here in your wrist bones. So stop share. Here is the humerus. Remember we've got this um, head of the humerus down along here. And here is the trochlea where the ulna connects. Here's the capitulum where the head of the radius uh, articulates. Here is epicondyle, the medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle. And so this ridge that's above that condyle is that supra condylar ridge. And you can see it's a very sharp ridge right along there. And part of the reason it's so sharp is because we have that brachioradialis pulling right there. And it strengthens itself to support that. One thing I want to show you with this guy 
is that you'll notice we have, let's pull from here to here, let's pull from here to here, and then you have, let's pull from here to all the way around here. Now these pulling points create a lot of strength in the arm flexion. These long, where they're mostly on the brachium, they provide a lot of strength to flexing the arm. But if you've ever used a lever or tried pulling on something, you know that, um, that you may have a little more strength when you pull there, but you don't necessarily have as much speed. If you pull from here to here, that is a weaker muscle, but this distant pulling point allows you to create a lot more speed. You can whip that arm up a lot faster. So the brachioradialis's big function is to really help add speed to the flexion of your arm. So let me go ahead and build that brachioradialis on, and we'll take a peek at it. All right, and once again, these ones don't like to connect very well, but you can see we start from this outer edge of this arm, and we come down along the radius to this styloid process. And if we pull, contract this muscle, we're going to create flexion of the antibrachium or forearm. All right, so those are our flexing muscles, and they're gonna get it up here, but once this arm is bent and we want to straighten it, we're gonna wanna pull the opposite direction from the back and extend the forearm. So when our arm is flexed and we want to backhand someone like that, wham, just backhand them. We're gonna need to use a muscle that runs over the back of that elbow joint so that when it pulls, it will extend our forearm. So let's look at the muscle along the posterior of your brachium that is involved in extension of the forearm. All right, so back to our open stacks recording. We looked at the front of the arm, the biceps brachii, the brachialis, and coming out here even lower down, let's zoom in, let's scroll down, here is our brachioradialis. Here it is on a dorsal view of the arm. All right. So that is the anterior side of the arm. Let's look at the posterior side of the arm. And in the back, this big muscle covering most of the back of the arm is the triceps brachii. So if you remember, the biceps got its name because it had two heads. The triceps, like triceratops, gets its name because it has three heads and still comes down to this single insertion point. And we aren't gonna worry too much about these three heads and they get names like the lateral head and the long head. And when I switch to this view, you'll see that they're just highlighting one of the heads. Here's the other head. So it's not super helpful, but here's the whole triceps. Here's the long head in green. Here's the lateral head and wrapping around the back is the medial head. We're just gonna look at it all together because it really is all one muscle. This is the triceps brachii. So its insertion points are these three heads and they come from a few places. We have the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. So to figure out where that is, well, here's the scapula. Remember that the glenoid cavity is this place where the head of the humerus articulates with the scapula. Infraglenoid means below the glenoid cavity, and sure enough, there's gonna be a little bump right below that glenoid cavity on the scapula. This is gonna be really tiny for you because I'm not gonna bother to zoom out, but a little bump right here below the tuboid, uh, sorry, below the glenoid cavity, and that's what we're gonna articulate with. Sorry, that's what we're gonna insert into or originate from, beg pardon, we're gonna originate from with this long head. Then we're also going to use the posterior shaft of the humerus and the, so here's the back of the shaft of the humerus and the posterior shaft um, distal to the radial groove. So another part on the posterior shaft, but even farther down. And so we're not gonna worry too much about that, but the main thing you can take away, we're connecting to the scapula, we're connecting to the humerus, much like we did with the biceps brachii, scapula, humerus. So it's working a lot similar. And then we have this lower head that's connecting halfway down. It's a lot like the brachialis. And all of them are coming here and you can see 
crossing that elbow joint to connect into that point of the elbow. So the insertion point is that olecranon process, that pointy bone of the elbow that's part of the ulna. Ulna and olecranon, ul, ul, both come from a word that means elbow. So let's look at our little skeleton here. We we'll turn them around backwards. And if you remember that elbow joint, this olecranon process sits into the fossa in the back of the humerus. And that's where we're going to pull to be able to pull that into that fossa and extend that arm. So we're going to pull here and attach about halfway up, about all the way up, and also over here. So all of this is going to allow extension of the forearm. So let me get that roughly put together. And as always, these arm ones really don't want to stick. But what you can see, we're connecting into that scapula, we're connecting up to the top or near the top of the humerus, and we're connecting all the way down to that point of the elbow. And so when we pull that muscle, we're going to extend that forearm. All right, and I promised or I mentioned that the other motions of the arm or the forearm that we're going to talk about are going to be the pro, uh, sorry, supinating and pronating. And the way I always remember this is supinating. It looks like you're serving soup. Your palm is turning away from the body, the face upwards or outwards. Supinate turns away from the body. It is a lateral a, or similar to a lateral rotation. Pronation, you turn in towards the body to face more down or down and out. If you just, man, you can just keep pronating if you really want to. Um, so I think of that like pro basketball, you put your hand down to dribble. So obviously, depending on how your arm is oriented, you're going to wind up with your palm facing different directions, but that outwards turn, supinate, inwards turn, pronate. And at rest, with your bones not crossed at all, you are supinated. And then if you turn it, you are pronating. So we are going to look at two muscles that help with pronation and supination. And they're going to have easy names to remember because one of them is called the pronator teres, and it pronates. And one of them is called the supinator, and it supinates. So easy names to remember. I think the tricky part about this muscle is that they're kind of small and short and tucked under things so that they can be hard to identify in a diagram. And just looking at a picture, it can be hard to visualize how they're making that arm pronate or supinate. So let's take a little bit to look at these and think about how they're getting their jobs done. All right, so here looking at the open stacks, this is a superficial or palmer, you could also call it an anterior view, palmer view of the front or interior of the forearm. And again, we can see that biceps brachii over here and running long along that radius out towards the thumb side of the hand is the brachia radialis. So the thumb would be over here. And then over here, running sort of across at an angle is the pronator teres. And remember teres, we've seen that word a couple times, means rope-like or rounded, and sure enough, it's another kind of rope-like muscle. And if we come over to Get Body Smart, this is the opposite arm, so now the thumb is on this side versus the thumb being on this side. So if we come over here, here's our brachioradialis running along here and running from the basically elbow across towards the thumb, so always kind of elbow to thumb, is that pronator teres. So pull some muscles away here. Again, here's the brachioradialis. Here's that pronator teres. Pull a few more muscles away. And sure enough, you can see that this muscle has a very cord-like or rounded appearance. So here is our pronator teres. And if you look at this muscle, its job is, of course, to pronate, which means you're going to want to take the arm and turn the thumb in towards the body to face more downwards. And you can actually see how by pulling on the thumb side of, excuse me, of the radius, you can pull 
that radius over and across to pronate the arm because the radius has to pull inwards and cross for a pronation movement. So in order to accomplish, it, accomplish this, we start by connecting here to a spot we've seen very similar. This is the medial epicondyle, pretty close to being a, another supracondylar ridge here. So we start on that medial epicondyle of the humerus and also on the ulna because we want to anchor both on the humerus and on the ulna to really help get that twisting crossing motion rather than just a flexion. We wanna be able to pronate. So anchoring on both of these guys helps us do that. And then we come across and around and this coming around to the lateral edge of the radius. And so by pulling on that lateral edge, we can pronate the arm. So I'm going to try to make this on my little skeleton man. Let's see, stop share. And I'm going to be taking his arm and I'm going to be creating a muscle that crosses from the medial epicondyle from the top of this ulna and comes across to the lateral edge of the radius so that when it pulls, it twists that radius across and turns that hand inwards, pronates for dribbling a basketball. So that's what we're trying to do. All right, be right back. So this is a muscle that starts from the pinky. Ooh, I've done it the wrong direction, possibly. <laughs> All right, no, we're good. This is a muscle that starts from the elbow. Wait, if I pull, I've done it backwards. <laughs> I'll be right back. I'm looking in a mirror here. Much better. All right. So I definitely was like, this doesn't make sense. This is a, move, a muscle that starts from the medial side of that elbow and ulna and crosses over to the thumb side of the radius so that when we pull on that thumb side of the radius, we twist the arm inwards to pronate. But across the other direction, it would have been supinating and that would have been wrong. <laughs> so here's the thing where again, looking at that muscle, thinking it through helps you predict and understand A, what muscle it is, or B, what that muscle does. All right, so now let's switch over and look at a supinator muscle. And you can probably already guess that this muscle, as we talked about, should be crossing a different direction. All right, so this is a muscle that I find um, harder to visualize how it works, partly because it's harder to find good images of what this muscle does or, or this muscle by itself. So for example, in your textbook here, this is the superior, or sorry, the anterior, the front or palmar side of the forearm, and you can see that pronator teres crossing over it. This is a dorsal or back view of the forearm and you can see that the pronator is, sorry, not the pronator, the supinator, the supinator is also not really visible in this one. We're gonna actually have to lift some of these superficial muscles of the forearm away and scroll down to a view of deeper muscles of the arm. So here down below, we have again a palmer view in a dorsal view, and here you can see the supinator. So we had to lift this pronator crossing over here and this brachioradialis out of the way. And underneath, you can find sort of one edge of the supinator on the palmer side of the arm, but most of the supinator wrapping around the thumb side of this arm and actually being mostly on the back of the arm, the uh, dorsal or posterior side of the arm. So rather than cross an opposite direction of the pronator, what it's going to do is pull around backwards instead of around to the front. So the pronator took this thumb side of the arm and pulled the thumb around the front. The supinator is going to take the thumb side of this arm and pull it around the back of the arm. So to give you another view of this, here is the supinator muscle. Here you can see it's attaching in the front of the arm, but wrapping around to the back and going to pull 
And as it pulls around to the back, it's going to twist that thumb outwards away from the body, which is a supinating motion. And I'm going to show you one more uh, image. This is a GIF. Again, I don't really know where this is from, but I found it online. And this is a GIF of that supinator in action. So here you can see that as we pull that thumb outwards and pull on the edge of that muscle, sorry, on the edge of that uh, radius, we are turning the arm outwards towards the thumb and supinating. Let's show it again. So again, I do find this a little bit harder to visualize, but once you get an image in your head, it's pretty easy to, or not easy, but it's more straightforward to understand um, how to tell it apart from the pronator. So here we have the pronator um, more superficially up with the brachioradialis cut those away and here we have kind of a little bit on this view but mostly on the back view the supinator so obviously the supinator has a straightforward name the supinator supinates and its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus so it may not be super obvious but as it starts in the back of that arm it does cross the joint remember it has to cross the joint or it's not useful so you can see that it's back here on this lateral epicondyle of the humerus. And you can actually see this somewhat on the front view of it as well. And it's also a little bit on the proximal or upper edge of the ulna. And so we're a little bit in the back of the arm back here. We're on the humerus, but importantly, we're on that ulna. And that connection to the ulna is what's going to allow us to pull the radius around towards the ulna and create that supination motion backwards laterally towards the ulna if we pull that radius backwards towards, towards the ulna, ulna laterally away from the body we create that supinating motion so this connection over here allows us to pull around from this insertion point up front which we can't see properly in this picture so let's go oops that's the pronator that's not it here we go this insertion point up front and in the front, it connects to the proximal end of the radius. So it's also up early on the radius, wrapping around the back to this humerus and early up high on the ulna in the back. So it's actually twisting around the arm to the back of that ulna. So let me go ahead and model that on my little guy and we'll see if we can visualize how it works. And so here's a case where I think it actually does sort of help to show, oops, that's not on the ulna mineral, how it's wrapping around the back from that ulna towards the front of the radius. And if we pull this radius backwards towards the ulna, back towards the ulna, and back across that joint towards the humerus, that's going to rotate along this proximal radial ulnar joint and get that supination. So the supinator is kind of around the back of the elbow. All right. So that is the last of the bones we're going to talk about that are involved in moving that forearm, the antibrachium. So the very last set of bones I want to talk about, let's see if I can find them in my stack, are going to be bones involved in moving the um, wrist and, sorry, not bones involved, muscles involved in moving the wrist and fingers. So give me one second and I'll pull those up. All right, so one thing you probably noticed, again, as we were talking about this pronator and the supinator, sorry, the pronator teres and the supinator and the brachioradialis is that when we get into the forearm, there are a lot of muscles happening in there. And that's because when you start moving the wrist and fingers, you have very fine muscle control of these movements. So you can get some really complex stuff happening here, which is what allows you to do things like write little tiny letters and do cool little carving and play video games really well. So that's our hand-eye coordination. So rather than expect you to learn all of these muscles right now, we are going to simplify things. And sort of like when we talked about the arm and we talked about how the arm acted upon the forearm and we categorized three muscles that flexed the arm, and one muscle that extended the arm, we are going to group these forearm muscles 
into muscles that flex the wrist and fingers. So remember, if we flex the wrist, we bend it towards the forearm. If we flex the fingers, we curl them in. And muscles that extend the wrist and extend the fingers. So we're going to get flexor muscles and extensor muscles. And just like on the arm, and the arm, remember, the flexor muscles were mostly in the front because they need to cross that joint in the front to flex. In the forearm, your flexor muscles are mostly going to be in the front so that they can flex that wrist and fingers. In the arm, that triceps was in the back to extend the arm so it could cross over the back of the joint and extend it. And in the forearm, your extensor muscles are going to be in the back so they can extend, or in this case, hyperextend that wrist and extend those fingers. So a way to visualize this is literally you can divide the arm muscles into anterior front and posterior back compartments. And this isn't just an arbitrary division. So if we pull up this figure here that is from the Mayo Clinic, uh, or probably Mayo Clinic, you can see that both the arm and the forearm have literal compartments within them. There are wrappings of membranes that divide these uh, sets of muscles into different compartments. And so up here, you can see that this biceps and brachialis, and lower down that brachioradialis, are in the anterior compartment of the arm and they are flexors. The triceps is in the posterior compartment and it is a extensor. Down here in the anterior compartment where suddenly we have so many more muscles because you have so many more little fingers and parts of your palm to move around, we still have a posterior compartment which contains uh, primarily, uh, it should contain extensors, this brachioradialis should really be uh, considered more of an anterior compartment muscle, but we're not really going to consider that because that's going to fit up here with these guys. Um, but in terms of these muscles here, these are our posterior compartment muscles and they are mostly flexors. And our anterior compartment muscle up here, which is, which are extensors. And so again, this is simplifying things, but it's a good way to do it. Um, again, another reason these compartments are medically relevant is, for example, things like infections are often limited to spreads within a certain compartment. So often damage because of these membranes in between them um, only affects uh, certain compartments and you can get different um, compartment syndromes. So for the purposes of your practical, what I'm going to want you to know is basically the phrase anterior forearm compartment muscles or anterior forearm flexor muscles. Either of those we're going to use interchangeably. And just know that if I show you, hey, what do the muscles in this front compartment of the arm do? Sorry, front compartment of the forearm, you should say they flex the wrist and fingers. And then you should know posterior compartment forearm muscles or posterior forearm uh, extensor muscles or extensor muscles of the forearm. You should be able to know, again, if I show you this posterior of the arm and say, what do the muscles in this compartment do? You should be able to say they extend the wrist and fingers. So we're going to broadly group them into big categories. You don't need to label each one, just be able to label, this is the anterior compartment of the forearm. This is the posterior compartment of the forearm. This group of muscles mostly flexes, this group of muscles mostly extends. So yeah, we are definitely simplifying just because again, as you start getting down here into the fine details, you get a lot of stuff to learn. So we're gonna focus on learning these upper arms and these big muscles really well for now. And then in the future, if you start needing these little fine detail muscles, you can start learning them and you'll have a really good foundation to start adding pieces to. All right, thank you so much for sitting with me while we talked about the muscles of the arm and uh, upper extremities. And I will try to get one more video together uh, in the future.
uh, that goes over the joints and nerves, which are the last parts of things that I want you to know about the pectoral girdle and upper extremities for your first practical. Bye guys.